Varsågod. Oh, hello. Hello, nice to see you. Well, yeah, there's a whole bunch of people over there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only uh -huh. saw seven people, so I now I wow. Okay. <laughs> Look at that. You're um, over there. Hi. No, there's more, but it's uh, yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with me on Skype. Um, I'm a great fan of your work, uh, and I'm wondering, do you ever get into legal trouble for what you do? Um, yes, we do, but it's it probably is uh, is a funny word because um, we have had we have had um, legal threats made against us many times, and we've had one lawsuit. Uh, in fact, in this last movie that we made called The Yes Men Are Revolting, you can see a scene where we get served a lawsuit from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and um, they taking us to court because we impersonated uh, them and announced that they were going to support climate change legislation or support legislation to combat climate change in the U.S. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is not part of the U.S. government. It's a private business lobby. Um, and so, you know, we were basically, uh, we pulled this prank on them and then they sued us. And... It went through the courts. It went through. Uh, it was heard by a bunch of judges who, who made various decisions until it was about to go to trial, and then they withdrew the lawsuit. So after four years, they withdrew the suit because I think they realized, for one thing, that we didn't clinch, that we actually wanted to go to court with them. It would have been super fun. <laughs> We're always trying to get people to sue us and then take them to court. And they pass the court because it's a really great opportunity if you're an activist to um, talk about them and also possibly to get some real information on the company uh, because private companies, particularly in the United States, don't have to disclose much at all about their business practices. But if they sue you and you're in court and you can, you can then ask them any question. There's a process of discovery where you can go and look at, for example, all their emails. So this is actually what's happening right now with the whole Anthony Weiner emails in the U.S. That's why there's this crazy thing with the uh, Clinton campaign right now where they're looking through Anthony Weiner, the former congressman Weiner's emails um, and that are then tied to Puma Abedin's emails, his uh, wife, uh, which are then tied to uh, Hillary Clinton because she was uh, Hillary Clinton's top aide. But that process they are going to be called discovery, where all, where this information is is coming out or being made available to the case. And it would have been really interesting for us to be able to go through that process with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce because we could have potentially found out who was donating money to them. You know, people like the Koch brothers are known to give them money, it, but it would be an amazing uh, thing to find out the details of, you know, how they were getting money, how they were spending it, um, and um, a whole bunch of other things related to, to sort of to our case. I mean, what they knew about climate change and when, um, because this is an organization that also, that also actively denied climate change um, for many years. And so being able to sort of catch them out on some of that stuff would have been fantastic. But secondly, we never had the opportunity to follow through because of the truth, dude. Um, it, it's interesting how fear works, though, of legal problems. Um, we used to be worried about that kind of thing. And I think we're, we used to be worried about that thing, that kind of thing because we're trained from when we're very young to avoid risk. And I don't mean just avoiding, I don't mean avoiding physical risk. I mean, uh, avoiding financial risk is a thing that we're trained to do at a super young age because we learn about this thing called liability and about how, for example, you know, you're not allowed to go certain places because the owners will feel a, a sense of liability or take away a piece of playground equipment because it's too dangerous um, because because it causes risk 
it exposes the you know the uh let's say whoever is maintaining the play the playground to the threat of being sued so you learn that you have to worry about being sued when actually it's not really that terrible it's just like a lot of like grunt work you know it means that you're going to spend a lot of time doing something that's a bit like your taxes you know it's, it's uh, but if somebody like uh you know, and then you have to think for a second, like, okay, psychopaths like Donald Trump don't worry about being sued. He's sued all the time, and it, it doesn't affect his life. And so at least grant yourself, <laughs> you know, at least grant yourself um, the, uh, I guess the, don't give you, I guess what I'm trying to say is, as a person who's not nearly as, psycho is Donald Trump, and I'm sure there's nobody in the room who can claim to be. Um, you know, you want to have at least equal rights as him. <laughs> you know, and so I would say the right not to freak out about being sued is something you should have even though you, you don't have a vast fortune. And I think that's in part because there's less risk. The, the, the less money you have, the less you can lose anyway. So who cares? Get sued. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll have a follow-up question from Yasser. Yeah. Hello. Um, can you see me? Yeah, I think so. So I. Um, I? Yeah. Okay, I have basically two questions. So you, we were talking about suing and maybe getting in jail and lo uh, legal issues. So we all know that in the environment or in the case of the United States, you have a lot of um, surveillance and the NSA and that everybody is, is being watched and so on. How does this affect um, you as activists, first of all? And the, the second thing is like, um, if you are going to tackle this issue, I mean, does it, does it like come into question to you to think about uh, tackling like people who get arrested and go to jail without even a trial, uh, people who go to Guantanamo Bay, uh, some some also like um, arrests based based on racism, that people just disappear and and you can never find about them. And one one last thing is uh, when you do actions where you impersonate people and infiltrate these um, conferences, for example. So uh, would you do it one more time and wouldn't people just uh, already know about you? Would you repeat it? And thank you. <laughs> okay, a couple questions there. So first of all, um, we have to answer the second question first. Uh, we have found that no matter how exposed we get in our weird little world, and no matter how much people know our faces, um, if you put on a fake beard or mustache, people tend to not recognize you anyway. And if one or two people at an oil conference do recognize you, they tend to keep it to themselves because they want to find out what's going to happen. <laughs> um, so that's so we're not we're not at that point where it it really has proven to be a threat. Recognition it does not seem to to matter to the type of action that we're doing. Now wait, the first part of the question though, which was much more like, uh, it seemed like a longer part to answer. Can you remind me of the, the gist of it again? It's about the surveillance and people who... Ah, surveillance, there, right. Right, so there's two parts to that question. First of all, there is a way in which we operate in a very privileged space. And we also are doing things that are, as far as we know, legal. I mean, most lawyers we talk to tell us that not to do it, but if, and occasionally we find a radical lawyer who uh, says that who, who encourages us to go ahead so that they can figure out what what means legally, because people te technically, really good lawyers technically, can't, don't just say this is legal or this is illegal. They they say, well, you should, you know, uh, <clears throat> we'd like to. Uh, Kind of like it fits in this sort of gray area of the law in many cases and in many countries. Um, but 
So what we're doing in the first place is not, it's mostly symbolic action. It involves infiltrating, but it, it doesn't involve fraud and it doesn't involve um, criminal law. Uh, usually if somebody was to try to, to take us to court, they would have to take us to court based on um, some kind of civil law issue. But it, as far as we know, we're not breaking any, um, you know, at least in the United States and most of Europe, we're not, um, we would not be prosecuted by the state. What we would be, what would happen is courts would be used by individuals or companies to uh, try to extract punishment or money from us, but none of it could involve jail time. It would involve money. Um, so we do work a lot with people who do more sort of um, straight up forms of direct action that involve trespassing, locking down, um, these sorts of things that tend to get one arrested and thrown in jail under criminal law. And so for those types of actions, it's really quite important that people understand the legal landscape and know how to communicate in ways that don't expose people related to the action. So, um, so those people, in those cases, that happens, um, you know. But for us, it's not. It's not really a matter of having that kind of that kind of communication. In fact, we've avoided actively avoided, in some ways, security culture, um, only because it seems to shut down. Uh, the, way, the ways in which people communicate freely, or the types of projects that we're doing, we actually sometimes feel like we would benefit by ha having um, somebody surveil us and find out about something we're planning and then try to stop it. Um, because it's so, the, the idea of trying to stop one of these things is, it becomes funnier when somebody does stop it. It's better for the camera, it's better story. Um, so a good example of this is that Chamber of Commerce thing that I was just talking about, where the U.S. Chamber of Commerce found out that the action was happening while it was happening, and they sent somebody over. The head of PR came running over to the press club where we were holding the event and burst into the room and created this amazing scene where he confronted us. And so realizing that the confrontation is part of the storytelling, um, you know, it means that we're, we don't worry too much about like blowing our cover or surveillance in that way. And since whatever, if we're talking about things, if, if the, the plans we're making are legal anyway, then it's hard to imagine that having the security culture necessary is worth it uh, psychologically, because what we, it's like the, the idea of being more and more emboldened to act instead of acting in fear. And sometimes when we collaborate with people, they get more scared when they have to activate security protocols. So um, we tend to be more like, fuck it, uh, we're not going to worry about it. Even though I totally understand why it's needed. And for some people, we do communicate um, you know, uh, using um, PGP or whatever. And it's getting so much easier now. That's the other thing is that <clears throat> five years ago, it actually was, you know, not as easy as it is now. It's so easy now to use, you know, encrypted. So maybe it's we've got to the point where there's no reason not to do it. Yeah. Um... To keep them guessing. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I have a brief question for you. Uh, I hope you can try to ask short, in short. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're obviously really good at uh, um, finding and exposing discourses uh, of um, power abuse. Um, and I, I just wonder, to which degree do you feel that you are actually able to uh, confront and challenge the discourses or changing um, the meaning of people who disagree with you from before? Are you, uh, my question is, um, are, um, are you able to like change discourses or are you foremost able to reach people who agree with you? 
Well, I would argue that um, we only are effective as part of a movement. And so, um, but, and I, I think that in some cases we do change individuals, especially young people. Um, you know, we, got, we get email every day from some young person who has something to say about the films, the movies. And I'd say about once a week we get an email from somebody who says that they saw the movie and it changed their life in some way. I mean, I'm talking about like, you know, teenagers. Uh, and especially our second movie, The Yes Men Fix the World, and that's in part because we released it on a peer-to-peer -peer -peer platform you know, when Pirate Bay was at its height. And uh, and so we got, you know, tens of millions of, of, of people watching it who are in this demographic that um, were kind of like feeling pissed off um, about things, but maybe hadn't formed very strong political opinions yet, with the exception of being a little bit like libertarian-y as you, like, because, there's a lot of that in, in like uh, programming and hacker culture, and so that people who are on like Reddit and 4chan already feel a little bit like they, you know, in general, to make a big broad generalization, uh, it's people who feel anti-authoritarian, and um, and and that there's tendencies were on the on the libertarian side, but you know. When they'd see these videos, they'd be like, holy shit, I, I understand it as something different now that I knew before. And so where that came to a head for us was in 2012 at Occupy Wall Street when we went down there we were, you know, early on, a couple days into the occupation, and everybody knew us, and a lot of kids came up to us, kids, I see like 20, 21-year-old kids, they come up to us and say, uh, you know, young adults, and say, I got into this because of you because I watched your movies, and that's, how I, that's why I'm here now. And, and so that moment, so when we look at our, and, and, and of course, I'm not saying that, you know, that there's a direct relationship, but to say that if there's like a bunch of people who saw the movie and it changed them a little bit, and then they went on and did something, part of a broader movement, yeah. then it is having an effect. Yeah. It's just not as direct as we might like yeah. to think it could be. Yeah. Um, and then it, there's all kinds of questions, like do those people keep going? Do they feel disillusioned after being evicted from the park? You know, um, <laughs> yeah. Like, then it's a question of what the nature of movements are and how they change over time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's but it's it's really interesting, and it's it's for us, it's we're constantly trying asking ourselves if it's working or not. Yeah. And um, and it's had actually a lot of ups and downs. There's been a lot of times when we thought it wasn't. We're just like, why are we doing this? This is dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're do, doing a great job and being really inspirational. Uh, we have a last brief question from the audience. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Baran. I'm a um, Kurdish musician, activist, and a, uh, a documentary filmmaker um, which left Norway for around eight years ago and I left the field of art and music um, and I'm um, jumping right into to, to the core of the of the questions that I want to ask you um, if art or political art is the toy or the um, mean to um, political change in society to the ideal society that we want to c create. Do you think what you do, uh, although I, I um, appreciate what you do uh, as Yes Men and also the work of uh, the Center of uh, Political Beauty, um, but I wonder if, if what we do now here um it's just a facelift for the beast um i wonder how much that kind of work um means like to target 
the powerful, those in power, how much it um, really can lead to the change that we want. Because as far as I'm concerned, and I know, um, the, the beast is very smart. Um, it manages to control the mind of the majority, not the majority, the, the big majority of the people. And in the meantime, we are going and targeting the beast. I feel like we are like doctors um, uh, using the method of conventional medicine, uh, treating the symptoms than the reason of the illnesses of um, our society. Uh, so I wonder, um, is that the um, formula for real uh, change in our society, and then I'm talking globally, or should we change our approach and maybe instead of targeting the beast, lift the majority of world peoples and world nations to fight down the beast. Because after all, um, we do have to agree that the strongest force that can fight the beast is the people. Thank you. Wow, great question. Um, and, and I think it kind of, uh, in a way, I think, I think, strangely, I think your question includes an answer to the question. <laughs> um, because clearly the system is, the system that we have now that reinforces and propagates uh, power relationships that are damaging and that are in fact jeopardizing the entire planet. Um, you know, it, it's, it could be like til tilting at windmills, you know, like the Don Quixote kind of style. Um, and that's why I think that we need, we need kind of like every method at the same time. I like personally believe that we've reached a kind of post-ideological moment where we need to kind of take everything that works and throw it at the biggest problem that we have. And that starts with climate change. And I say it starts with climate change because without fixing that, everything else, all the other problems amplify, right? Knowing that a lot of the, a lot of the refugees are uh, indirectly climate refugees. Um, and so if, if that approach, using everything that works, I would say means um, using structures available within capitalism. <laughs> but I think it also means building the alternative utopian futures alongside the current system so that we can make the switch over. You know, I mean, reading somebody like, uh, I think Bill McKibben, you know, I think says it quite well in his articles uh, about what needs to happen on a local level to rebuild economies in ways that... Um, are, are just and equitable, and at the same time reduce CO2 emissions, and treat you know migrants differently, treat uh, these these so-called problems uh, as something else, even as in, in a lot of places as opportunities. Um, so I guess, uh, but I would say that right now, that unfortunately. I think the era of ideological struggles that grapple with each other, um, uh, that, I mean, I, I should say, the, it's, it's a very weird, I don't know if I'm right about this, I might be totally full of shit, but it seems to me that like there isn't time to have a battle of ideologies anymore, and so much of the way we've seen the last century define the previous century was over uh, ideological approaches that were kind of seized upon by fundamentalists, uh, you know, and, and and then went gravely wrong. I mean, in the U.S., 
we have this the fundamentalist approach to free market capitalism which totally ran off the rails you know and has fucked over so many people and is in a sense the reason that we can't control climate change right now we've, we've turned over the you know turned over our decision making to the market and so that leaves us without any uh teeth to actually be able to uh bite into this problem to be able to um to deal with it and so that, re that requires a uh, you know real alternative models um but can we implement the alternative models in a way that you know yeah I, we build them alongside the current system that's i guess what i would i think that we do and meanwhile within the current system we try to reform it quickly and we try to come up with action that is so radical that it moves the center. You know, uh, in the U.S. right now, at least, it is actually a little better than it was um, during the first Bush administration, insofar as people talk about the 1% versus the 99%. Uh, before Occupy Wall Street, they didn't. Afterwards, they did. We have this bizarre anomaly of the fascist rising <laughs> under Trump under like a TV, you know, billionaire. But um, that, I, 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 I'm hoping that that's just like a blip in an overall successful uh, movement that pushes things um, further in the direction of a kind of humanism so, um, and away from the sort of fascist um, and turbo capitalist models that we've had. But in the meantime, yeah, we should also build that alternative. Like, and there are people doing it, I think, in a lot of ways. And, and uh, I think that's real earnest and, and very good project to be involved in. I just, just as a maker, back to what hasn't been my, my mode. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're quite uh, eager to see uh, the finished film and your continuous projects. And of course, Thank I you. think I speak for all of us when I say that we wish you luck with the forthcoming elections. <laughs> <So> <laughs> You're always welcome to Norway. <laughs> so thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm really sorry I couldn't yeah. be there with you guys. And I'd, I'd especially you know, love to, to actually talk with you, uh, you know, in yeah. smaller groups so yeah. um next time yeah i think it's really interesting now we're kind of entering a lot of very intriguing questions about uh, the relationships between uh, ideology informed work and theory and uh, opposing action and uh, how to attack the beast or perhaps the beasts i mean there are perhaps more uh, multiple solutions and we we may not agree on everything here so <laughs> yeah but I hope uh, that people are uh, starting to get warm and engage so that we can continue this debate and I guess you will be going back to bed or something or will you stay with us <laughs> um, I'm gonna hang out on, on this uh, on this connection here and listen and uh, if I have something really important to say I'll try to say it oh yeah Although, uh, I do. Um, I, I recognize that there's also, you know, limitations to engaging somebody on Skype while you're having a discussion. So yeah, I'll sit back and listen. Okay, thank keep, you. That's great. Give me the background there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I. I <laughs>